Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Are You Chinese or Taiwanese? And our guest is Dr. Evan Dolly, visiting scholar, Institute of Taiwan History, Academia Sinica in Taipei, Taiwan. Hi. Evan, great to see you. Uh, well, I'm really glad you could uh, be with us today. Uh, and I, I know your time at uh, Academia Sinica is getting quite short, so you must be thinking about returning to the U.S. and all that. So thank you very yeah, much sure, for making sure. time for us. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, to talk to you, Bill. I really appreciate it. I'm delighted to, to get the chance to, to do so. Great, great. Well, um, it, your research is really interesting, and this is the, really the kind of stuff that the Institute of Taiwan History really gets into, identity, yeah. Taiwanese identity, and what are all the ramifications of it. I mean, it's really a fascinating topic. Um, you have a lot of concern um, differentiating between ethnic identity and nationalistic identity. And you, yeah. if I'm interpreting you right, you'll really come down on the side of ethnic identity. So sure. why is that? Why is your, why is your focus on um, ethnic identity? Okay, sure. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a bit of a long answer, uh, as these often these things often are. But um, to sort of <laughs> sum it up, um, I started with the sense that the general narrative uh, of world history that, is, that people propose is this process of nation building, um, the nation state as the uh, the sort of epitome of, of modernization in, in political forms. Um, and the nation state is this new thing, this new entity uh, that combines people and government and territory um, in really a single unit that has no uh, compar no real parallel in a, a pre-modern era. Um, and so the history of, of modern societies in general are talked about as sort of a progression uh, along a road towards building the nation state or imagining the nation state. Um, and uh, that has also really been the way in which Taiwan has been studied, right? Most of the studies of Taiwanese identity have looked at, at, na at nationalism and uh, a process of imagining a Taiwanese nation. Um, and I'm not really arguing against any of that. I don't think that they, those uh, ideas or, or models are, are wrong. They certainly um, have been very powerful uh, identities and, and structures in the modern world. But I did kind of want to look at, at alternatives to see if there are non-national identities out there. Um, and, um, you know, as I started to think about the relationship between ethnicity and nationality, uh, I realized that a lot of the, the scholarship on nationalism looks at ethnicity as this sort of pre-modern or primordial identity, mm. right? Something that's inherited, uh, that is innate to people. Um, but then I started, you know, when I was reading about scholars who look at ethnicity, they actually talk about it as, as constructed in the modern era uh, through processes of border definition um, or political manipulation. Um, so thinking of ethnicity as also a modern identity, I began to think about, well, what what are the differences uh, between ethnicity and nationality? Um, because they have a lot of things in common, right? They're both linked to space, to territory. Yeah, it seems to me it's um, pretty hard to separate them. Right, yeah, no, it does become very difficult to separate them. And really the, the main thing that differentiates the two is this um, idea of the nation state. Uh, the ultimate goal for national identities are creating an autonomous independent nation. Um, but for ethnic identities, the ultimate goal is primarily the protection of the ethnic group, um, ensuring the survival of that group. It doesn't necessarily have to be connected to, an, to a national identity. Um, it can, in fact, be uh, either linked to or autonomous from a national identity. Great. I, I should really mention right here, right here in the very beginning of our, of our talk, that um, our guest today has a book that will be coming out in a year or so. It's called Becoming Taiwanese, Ethnic Identity and the Border of China and Japan. It's being uh, published by Harvard University Press, and I'm certain it'll be available on Amazon and certainly at Harvard University Press. This yeah, online hopefully. And, and you um, can make your order. Um, <clears throat> Interesting. Now, I should say that the, the title might change slightly as, as it goes through production, but it will definitely be Becoming Taiwanese, so you can look for okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. And, and of course, there's so many people who study about Taiwan, this is a really hot topic. And, and for, yeah, for sure. Taiwanese, this is a really hot topic because we see this, this sense of Taiwanese identity deepen and deepen and deepen. <laughs> um, now, 
What's really interesting to me in reading some of the notes that you sent me uh, about yeah. your research is you focus a lot on the city of Geelong. Yes. And, I, you know, I think it might be interesting to our listeners uh, and our viewers um, to tell us why. Why, are, why. why is there this focus for Geelong? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, all right, Geelong, um, you know, any uh, foreign visitors to Taiwan over the last several decades and many people in who are permanent residents in Taiwan, uh, natives of Taiwan, don't necessarily know why I would study Geelong either, because, you know, it, <laughs> it, it's not the most um, developed, uh, exciting city in Taiwan these days. Um, uh, I recently learned that um, Geelong currently has the highest rate of unemployment and drug use in of all of Taiwan cities. So it's, it, it's a bit of a, an economically all. depressed place now. But that wasn't the case in the first half of the 20th century, which is the period that I primarily focus on. Um, during that period of time, Geelong was actually one of Taiwan's most important cities. Um, it was the uh, third or fourth largest. Um, it was the focus of a lot of developmental, pro uh, developmental projects, really actually going back to the late Qing and then the Japanese period and the nationalist period after. All those governments really focused on developing Geelong as a harbor so that they could then develop and modernize Taiwan as a whole. Um, so Geelong, once upon a time, was, was really a significant place. And, and the processes uh, that went on in Geelong were really both somewhat typical to Taiwan's other cities in this era, but also Geelong was really in the forefront, um, I think, in a lot of ways. Now, at this particular time, and I, I think you cite the period 1880s, uh, the 1880s and 1950s. Yeah, so yeah. you right. Geelong is more important than Kaohsiung because Kaohsiung is usually, in, in today's world, is usually pointed to as Taiwan's number one port. The, yeah, the, sure. The, bed, the bedrock of heavy industry, shipbuilding, yep. iron, steel, all that stuff. But in this time, yeah. in your time period that you're concerned with, Geelong uh, ups. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Geelong was the, the, the focus for uh, import and export under the Japanese, and then early after 1945, really until 1955 or so, Geelong had the largest volume of trade for Taiwan. Uh, Kaohsiung sort of surpassed it for um, exports in the, the war years, in the you know late 30s, early 40s, uh, but then Kaohsiung was so heavily damaged by the Allied bombing campaign during the late stages of the war mm. that Geelong again sort of resurfaced in the post-war period as the primary of entry and exit um, for Taiwan's trade. Well, you know, another thing that just kind of jumps into my mind, uh, from a military point of view, Kaohsiung yeah, has sure. always been very important to the Japanese, to the nationalists, yep. to today's government. Yeah, was sure. Geelong, in your period of, of focus, was it militarily more important than Kaohsiung, or did Kaohsiung have the advantage there? I, uh, Kaohsiung pretty much always had the advantage there. I mean, not in the very first decades, Maybe the first 15 or 20 years of Japanese rule, Geelong was also the focus for, um, you know, a military establishment. But because the Japanese focus was on expansion southward from mm. really the 19 teens onwards, right. uh, that's when Kaohsiung became more important as a military installation. Uh, and then, as I said, eventually as an export uh, for products heading towards Southeast Asia. Well, um, in some of the notes you sent me, you talked about the process of identity construction. Yeah, and there sure. was one point that you, you mentioned elites and individuals and elites or leaders, leaders of any society help to form the identity of that society. But one yeah. point that really sort of um, grabbed my attention was where you talked about state-sponsored religion. Sure. And I, 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 I thought, well, I think he means doing Japanese colonialism, the role, the importance affixed to Shinto. Yeah, and yeah. And you can still see some Shinto shrines around Taiwan, kind of left over from the old days. Yeah, right. Uh, many of them have been repurposed uh, as national martyr shrines um, oh, right, under right, the, right, the current, right. well, after 1945. Right. Um, Okay, and okay. Besides that, besides mm -hmm. the the use of Shinto and molding um, colonial identity by the Japanese, sure. how how did like the nationalists when they first came to Taiwan? How did mm -hmm. they use religion to mold um, uh, an identity that was um, acceptable to the nationalists? 
Yeah. Well, that's that's a really great question because religion is really at the heart uh, of identity formation. Um, it's really one of the most important features, uh, if you will, of the way in which Taiwanese became Taiwanese. Um, and if I can step back and give a little bit of background before I get directly to your question, um, yeah. this is how it also relates to the title of the talk today is, are you uh, Chinese or Taiwanese? Because um, the religion or the aspects of religion that became sort of the core of a Taiwanese identity uh, were temples and deities and festivals that came out of the Chinese religious tradition, right? They were brought to Taiwan by settlers during the Qing period um, and became important parts of their lives uh, during the Qing period. Um, and then during the Japanese period, those were really the institutions and the practices that people rallied around the most to differentiate themselves from the Japanese. Mm. So as the Japanese were trying to impose Shinto, um, and also Japanese settlers were trying to institutionalize Japanese uh, Buddhist sects. Um, the people who became Taiwanese really held on to what had been um, parts of the Chinese religious tradition to define themselves uh, as not Japanese and also as Taiwanese. Um, and then after 1945, um, the nationalist government, when it arrived, it sort of looked at the religious practices that the people in Taiwan were engaged in and kind of viewed those as, uh, you know, superstitious and backwards and unhygienic. Um, these were the sorts of practices that actually the nationalists had been fighting against um, in the mainland during the 1930s through their New Life movement, right. uh, their New Life right. campaign. Um, so when they arrived in Taiwan, finally, <laughs> sorry for that long background there, um, they tried to modify local religious practice, shall we say. They tried to uh, encourage people to practice Buddhism, um, follow Confucian ideals more closely, and also maybe to uh, adopt um, or to, to convert to Christianity, because that was seen uh, as a modern, rational religion now, instead of an old, superstitious one. Uh, let, let, let's try to be a little specific here. Catholicism, um, Protestantism, um, I, I don't suppose the nationalists would have been too big on uh, Presbyterianism because that was yeah, sort it, of the... Uh, religious bedrock of the Taiwanese liberation movement. Right. So I don't think they would be too interested in that other than to maybe besmirch it. Um, um, but how about like Methodist, uh, Episcopalian? Um? Um, so, right, so the Presbyterians, of course, have a, had a, a long um, established tradition in Taiwan going back to the 19th century. Um, and as you say, it became uh, a key location for the Taiwanese independence movement to, to develop in Taiwan during the 60s and 70s, um, even a little earlier. Uh, but the nationalists in this case were sort of hamstrung by their own policy, right? Their national policy was for freedom of religion. So they couldn't crack down on the Presbyterian church. Um, they could, however, encourage people to maybe Methodist, I think was, was, was uh, seen as um, a good one to go into. Um, it's not that the nationalists really um, promoted Abit, Christianity Abit, um, the same I, way. Let me jump in we'll here. Start. I'm being told uh, that we need to take a break. Okay. okay. So we'll take a one-minute break, and we'll be right back, and we will continue this conversation exactly from the point where we're leaving off here. Absolutely. If you're watching Thank Asian you. Review, I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Are You Chinese? Are You Taiwanese? Our guest is uh, Dr. Evan Dolly, a uh, visiting scholar at the Institute of Taiwan History at uh, Academia Seneca in Taiwan. And we'll be right back, so don't go away. I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Thank you. 
kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Are You Chinese or Taiwanese? And our guest is Dr. Evan Dolly. Uh, he is a visiting scholar at the Institute of Taiwan History at Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Back here in the U.S., he is a, an assistant professor at Galter College. And just before the break, we were talking about um, how the nationalist government, when it first came to Taiwan in 1949, how it sought to use religion to mold a, um, an identity amongst the Taiwanese population that was, shall we say, politically acceptable to them. And um, it looks like we have sort of gotten to the point where we thought they were putting a lot of emphasis on the use of Methodism. Am I saying that right? Whaley. It's easier to say yeah. Chinese. Isn't yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think we'll pick it up from there. Okay, sure, sure. So we, as we I was starting to, to uh, use the getting to get towards saying. Because um, that, was the, that was the the religious bedrock of the Taiwanese independence movement, which they were uh, adamantly averse to. Right. Right, uh, a different uh, right, a different version, a different branch of the Protestant tradition was the bedrock of the independence movement. Um, whereas, uh, right, the Jiang family themselves were were Methodists, um, had been for uh, well, I guess Jiang uh, Jiang Kai Shek had converted uh, for his wife, um, and then the that sort of became the the, the family practice, as it were. But um, they couldn't again because the the constitution guaranteed freedom of religion. They couldn't really um, overtly push people into particular churches or particular branches of, of uh, Christianity, Protestant, Catholic, Catholic, whichever. Um, but what they could do was encourage the formation uh, of Christian organizations that were nominally private, um, but also could get closely linked to the state. Mm. Um, they did the same with Buddhist organizations that, that, that would have, um, you know, state support, uh, they, they didn't, and then they could use, um, and then through that state support, they could sort of encourage the growth uh, of, of particular types of, of belief, perhaps. Um, and, and again, direct the uh, popular religion away from um, the focus on, on you know, worship of, of a range of deities and um, sacrifices at their festivals and, you know, uh, um, other sorts of things that were seen as superstitious. You know, this is a very interesting point. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and the communists, the CCP, did the same thing on the mainland. Yeah. They were very, very averse to these, yeah. these yeah. superstitious beliefs and just wanted to get rid of those. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It, it's really amazing. There's a, I'm not sure that the KMT and the CCP agreed on much, but on this point, they, they did seem to agree. They certainly had a lot of similarities, um, except for two, two things happened. Um, one, I think the, the, the nationalists was were not quite as, um, they definitely were not quite as zealous uh, as the, the communists on the mainland were. And then two, um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was an interesting switch, or an interesting shift, uh, as sort of a, um, a response, a reaction against China's cultural revolution. Um, the nationalists began to promote Taiwan as sort of the bastion of Chinese culture. And one of the ways in which they did that was by um, allowing a lot of the popular temples to, to begin to flourish again. So it's in the 70s and 80s that a lot of the temples um, that are really one of the defining characteristics of Taiwan today, right, all these popular deities, Mazu, um, uh, Guan Di, um, there's a huge list and I can't even begin to do it justice. Um, but temples to those gods really began to flourish in the 70s and 80s um, as part of this effort to portray Taiwan as the real China. Right. Um, so some of the restrictions that the nationalists had placed on those practices in the 50s and 60s began to be lifted. Uh, and this is why still today in Taiwan you see um, elaborate mazu festivals and people go uh, and light incense at, at, at temples to deities all the time. Well, let me ask you this. Now, this is, this is a, a subject that just really fascinates me. Mm -hmm. is, uh, sure. Okay, it, what's the difference between Chinese and Taiwanese? In other words, where does Chinese culture stop and where does Taiwanese culture take over? Yeah. Is there any particular characteristics that you can attribute to each? 
That is a particularly difficult question um, because, as I said before, uh, so much of what has become or what, what the Taiwanese have used to identify themselves uh, originally came from, you know, uh, Fujian and Guang, Guangdong provinces, right, uh, from the uh, from the southeastern coast of Taiwan. Um, uh, Languages as well, right? Taiwanese is primarily um, based upon Minanhua, uh, or the Fujianese uh, language spoken in parts of Fujian. Um, so, finding the exact divide between um, Taiwanese culture and Chinese culture is difficult, um, maybe even <laughs> impossible. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, they share the same identity, mm. uh, if that makes sense. Well, now that you brought it up, go with that a little bit further. Yeah. Then I have a follow-up sure. question to ask you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is where uh, uh, a definition of ethnicity that is seen as historically constructed um, and um, contingent on particular circumstances becomes important. Um, because as the Taiwanese use these religious features to define themselves first against the Japanese and then against the nationalists, they began to identify those features, particularly with the island of Taiwan. Even if there might have been similar practices still going on uh, in China, and even if to this day some temples in Taiwan make pilgrimages to temples um, off the coast of Fujian, they still see uh, those deities as rooted in some ways in Taiwan, and their, their temples certainly is rooted um, in local settings. Uh, so that's sort of how um, these religious features became localized to Taiwan and associated with a Taiwanese identity as distinct from a Chinese identity. You know, I, I sometimes um, think, I think of, of, of America's experience. America was 13 British colonies and uh, the culture, yeah. sort of high culture, was all British culture, right? And then America became independent, and there began to be the evolution of American literature and American yeah. ideas and American values and an American identity. And, yeah. and I sort of see Taiwan in the same light. I mean, Taiwanese identity was suppressed for so long by the nationalists. Yeah. You know, school books were all about China and some yeah. obscure river in China where people didn't know about, you know, major <laughs> rivers in Taiwan. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous in a way. Um, and, and, and then you, you see this kind of like identity begin to bubble up. And, and then the other thing that, that kind of occurs to me, maybe it's because I lived in Japan for about eight years, but I see a lot of Japanese influence in Taiwan, a lot, and in, in the culture, especially in Taiwanese people. And, mm -hmm. and a, um, a, a, a lot of the day-to-day -day cultural life, I think, of Taiwan is, is, is influenced by the, the, the Japanese experience. And certainly, even when you look at the government, the electoral system of Taiwan is a Japanese import, basically. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the ways in which the government is, is structured is sort of a, very similar to the structure of South Korea, and they both were Japanese right. colonies. And a lot of the structure was left over and built on by a South Korean yep. government or a, a rock a Republic of China government. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, um, so I, I don't know. I, I often sort of bounce back and forth between these two ideas. Well, what's Chinese, what's Japanese? And, you know, how are, how are Taiwanese different? You know, I mean, this is kind yeah. of an interesting question. Now, I had this experience in, in Taiwan last year. Everywhere I went, you know, asked people, mm -hmm. are you Chinese or Taiwanese? You know, let's see what they say. <laughs> you know, I did my own kind of polling. <laughs> And so many people would say, Taiwanese, Taiwanese definitely. And it, it was sort of like, I got the sense that uh, in today's world in Taiwan, it's politically correct to say you're a Taiwanese, <laughs> even if you might consider yourself Chinese. And some people, they were sort of hem and haw. Well, I'm sort of Taiwanese, but my mother came from China, so I'm kind of right. back and forth, you know. Uh, I, I don't know if you had a similar experience. I don't even know if that's well, so a valid observation. Let me see. But it's uh, a couple of thoughts on, on sort of uh, the, this, this, um, the comparisons to Japan um, and, and those questions of Chinese or Taiwanese. Uh, so first, there's definitely, I think, still a strong awareness of cultural connections with China. Mm -hmm. um, that was certainly the case uh, in the period that I studied, and I think that that has still continued in some ways, um, perhaps in some cases also family connections. Um, but Chinese identity has become so strongly a national identity uh, 
And that's one that the people um, in Taiwan are not really a part of. Uh, right, so they're, whoa, whoa, whoa. and that there. became say apparent that, say, actually say in 1945. Say that again, because I want to make sure I got that right. I think I missed part of that. Um, Sorry. Okay, Chinese identity, if I heard you right, has become so much, so, um, uh, how should I say, nationalistically tinted. Yes, yes. Okay, that, it, and we're talking about mainland China here, right? Yeah, and also about the, the nationalists when they arrived in 45, okay. right? Their Chinese consciousness, their Chinese identity was very much a national identity. Okay. Um, no, and that's saying like that where the, the contrast. Oh, sorry. Does that still exist today? Does that phenomenon still exist today? Uh, there's probably a small segment of people who still hold on to that. Um, but it's a, uh, surveys at least suggest it's a very small minority of people who, who still uh, see themselves as linked to uh, a Chinese nation state um, in Taiwan. Mm, okay. okay um, and well, partly that has okay. to do uh, with the experience of Japanese rule. I mean, that those 50 years, um, maybe not so much for the remnants of Japanese culture that were left in Taiwan, but for the experience of being within a different political context, uh, national context, um, that is the Japanese empire, that separation sort of forced people who became Taiwanese to, to, to deal with a different context, if you will, and to develop their identities um, along paths that were different than the paths that the Chinese were developing their identities on. I agree with you. I agree with you quite wholeheartedly. And my personal view is, I, we never discussed this in, in Taiwan, yeah. but I, I, I think any kind of unification between Taiwan and China is, is pretty difficult because both societies have evolved in totally different ways. Yeah, they really have. They really have. Um, uh, and that, that is apparent, has been apparent to pretty much anyone I've spoken with who has been um, both uh, on the mainland and here. Um, they, they, they see immediately differences. In, in just the way people interact with each other, uh, and the way people, oh, yeah, sort yeah. of the pace the of life around Taiwan. Each other. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, this might seem a little bit harsh to say, but hey, we're seeking truth, so uh, here we go. Yes. Um, being in Taiwan last year, I thought I could, after a while, tell the difference between a Chinese person and a Taiwanese person. Mm -hmm. And the giveaway was the Chinese person was far more aggressive. Yeah, that's sort of the, uh, that is, I've heard uh, a lot of people say that as well. Um, that, that's sort of one of the, the signs to look for. Yeah. Waiting in lines or not waiting in lines, things like that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm getting the signal here. We're down to our last minute. Um, oh, dear. Is, is there any, you know, the, that's the trouble with the show, the time goes so <laughs> fast. Yeah, uh, and there's so many interesting you want avenues to, get, to take. Get in here in our last 45 seconds. Um, well, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, one, one, one final thought. So let me talk a little about uh, the memory of the past. Um, so this past. Remember, we only got 30 seconds searching. now. <laughs> what? Sorry. I'm sorry, but we've only got 30 seconds. I hate to do that yeah. to you, but so that's, the, the memory, that's the, the, the way in which the past that I've studied has been remembered is largely through rose-tinted glasses, right? People often look back on the Japanese era in particular as, uh, or as, a, as a better time. But that is entirely a post-45 reimagining of the Japanese period. Um, so I want to sort of stress that, that um, really what happened uh, was Japanese colonization followed by, by Chinese recolonization um, caused people to view the Japanese period in a different way than they had viewed it when they were in the middle of it. Um, so if that, if that could be my final point, that's, that's where I'll leave off. Great. Well, uh, just a reminder, um, our, our guest today has a book coming out. Um, it's going to be a little while, but keep it, keep it, keep it in mind. It's called Be Becoming Taiwanese, Ethnic Identity at the Border of China and Japan. I want to thank our guests for joining us today from, uh, via Skype from Taiwan, and I want to thank you for viewing. Next week, we'll see you again. My guest then will be U.S. Navy uh, Captain Retired Carl Schuster, uh, who teaches at Hawaii Pacific University and is also a defense analyst. We'll see you then. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome.